Right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for coming in out of the sunshine. I do apologise that you're having to miss this gorgeous English weather, the, almost the first sunny day that we've had. Um, but here we are. I'm going to be talking to you about Ocean World. And my name is Gloria Barnett. And I'm also known as the weird fish lady. But before we start, I just want to make sure that you understand. I'm going to be talking about weird fish and I'm not a weird lady. That is, of course, unless you know me and uh, some of my f f family and friends would probably argue with that comment. OK, who am I? I'm an environmental educator, so I do talks like this. Uh, I'm a science consultant, so I go visiting in primary schools and talking about weird animals. And I'm also an author. So uh, this is me. Here is me on stage. Uh, since COVID locked in, I'm afraid I uh, haven't been around the world quite so much as I've, I've been used to. I'm used to talking at conferences with 600 to 1,000 people in front of me. Um, but it's very cosy today. We're just having a small family group with us. And uh, I'm really pleased to see you all. Well, here I am when I'm not on stage, I'm underwater. So here I am as a scuba diver with a video camera. Um, I'm totally uh, addicted to taking video underwater. And this is one of my videos. And uh, this is the most magnificent uh, hawk bill turtle. Now, to begin with, I thought he was trying to kiss me. But actually, no, I think he's trying to communicate. Turtles are very communicative and they, they really do love to come up and say hello to divers. But I actually wonder what it is he's really trying to say and ask. Perhaps he's asking us to look after the oceans and not throw plastic in. Uh, you'll see from the film that the front flippers are doing all the work uh, and the back legs are just hanging back, acting as rud rudders so that they change direction. So a beautiful creature. Uh, and the Red Sea in Egypt. Right, let's see if my cursor will now make me go on. Yeah, here we go. Right, so now you know who I am and what I do. Let's start the talk. Firstly, I'm going to do a little bit about the oceans and weird fish. Then I'm going to talk about environmental problems. OK, so planet Earth is our home. We all know it as the blue marble. And of course, the blue is the ocean. There is 70 percent, 70 percent of water covering our lovely planet and only 30 percent of land and i expect most of you probably knew that but i hope i'm going to be telling you lots of new stuff as well this afternoon so here's a picture from a satellite now this is just the pacific ocean there are five big oceans in the world but the pacific is the biggest and although you, you can see a large quantity of blue already on the uh, picture here, it is actually all of the Pacific. Um, uh, all, all, of, all that you can see is the Pacific, but there is more of the Pacific hiding behind the back. So if you went around at 11 o'clock, you would eventually come across Japan and the islands of Japan. If you went around at four o'clock, you would end up going towards South America and the uh, waters of the Pacific lapping against the shores of the, uh, the ocean, uh, of the, the shores of, um, of Chile. But the thing about the Pacific Ocean is that it's 32% of the Earth's surface. So it's actually bigger than all of the land pushed together. So pretty vast. OK, now from the Earth to the moon, it's 384,000 kilometres. And the astronauts travelled all that way. We were very clever as human beings and got astronauts in space, sent them to the moon. But, you know, we've only explored 5% of our oceans. And from the surface to the deep, deepest part of the sea, it's only 11 kilometres. So some people will wonder, why on earth have we not explored the oceans a bit better? Well, the ocean's deepest part is here in the Pacific. It's south of Japan, east of the Philippines and north of <coughs> Australia. And it's the depth of 11 kilometres in somewhere called the Mariana Trench. Now, to give you some perspective of 11 kilometres, this is the tallest thing on Earth from surface uh, sea level. Now, this is obviously Everest in the Himalayas. Now, if I were to uh, cut off <laughs> the mountain with a large sharp knife and carry it and dump it into the Pacific, in fact, this is what would happen. The largest, highest thing on Earth wouldn't even touch the surface of the water. 
So you've got a very large sort of idea now about how deep the water really is in comparison to uh, the exploration of human beings. Now, if you were to climb Mount Everest, there are a few, probably a few hundred people now who've done it, but not many when you consider the human population on Earth. Um, but Mount Everest, it's physically challenging, it lacks oxygen, and of course, it's extremely cold. Now, it's very similar deep in the oceans. It's physically challenging, it lacks oxygen, and it's very cold, but it also has the fact that it is very high pressure because all of the water above you will press against your body. So you have to be in a submersible. You can't go down as a scuba diver. And the last thing, of course, at the bottom of the ocean, it's incredibly black. There is no light that reaches beyond about two kilometers down in the oceans. So the oceans are black and deep. And to some people like me, it's an alien world. Now, the marine environment, uh, let's have a look at that. If you look at the person, look, big lungs, lots of air spaces. We are not built to go underwater because the high pressure will push against those lungs, will collapse our ribs. And actually, you know, quite honestly, we die after, with a certain amount of pressure on our bodies. We cannot go as scuba divers down. What we do do is we breathe out oxygen from the atmosphere. We can take in 20% oxygen, breathe out 16% and use 4% of oxygen every time we breathe in for the, making the, the energy in our bodies. The oceans, however, don't have any proper oxygen as, at all. They don't have gas uh, as such. It's dissolved in the water. And it's only if you can get the oxygen out of the seawater, then you can live in water. And only fish um, and other creatures that have devised different ways of doing that. But fish gills and other different organs that some of the fish have take the, the oxygen out of dissolved water. And it's only 1% in seawater. So there's not an awful lot of it. Uh, so you have to be very specialised to live in the water. And that is not human beings. Now, it's very cold as you go down, very high pressure. I've put one little tiny diagram up at the top there of a diver just showing you with an arrow and a red dot. By comparison to the whole of the ocean and depths of the ocean, we only go in the top 30 to 40 metres. If we go any further down than that, it's not safe. So we have um, life in the oceans, the top 200 meters in the oceans uh as we've got the uh, sorry I just realized i haven't started my timer right put that on um the top that that thing that the black thing that looks a bit like a, a wine glass which says something about me if i see shapes like that and think of wine um yeah that's the area where most of life in the top 200 meters is living yes there is life further down and i will talk to you about that uh, in a moment but mainly most things in the ocean live in the top 200 and that is because the sunlight is important for both warmth and light now the oceans themselves lack light there is light to about 100 meters down uh, but it gets very very sort of you know shady as you go down i don't use my camera below 25 meters because there isn't enough light. Uh, twilight zone goes down another two kilometers and then you're in pitch black. So nine kilometers or more, depending where you are in the world, up to nine kilometers, you're gonna be in pitch black. Now, the last thing is that, that when the astronauts went to the moon, they, they were very lucky because there were no predators walking around on the moon trying to chase them. Whereas when I'm filming underwater, I have creatures coming up behind me. And when I get back on the dive boat, uh, some of my dive companions start to joke and say, Gloria, did you see that big turtle behind you? And those people that don't know me say, Gloria, you had a shark coming up behind you. And I, they don't realise that I've dived with sharks for many, many occasions and they don't worry me at all because I wouldn't be in the waters with the, the three sharks that could really hurt you. Um, so, yeah, underwater, it is not a zoo. This is natural world. These creatures are not in cages. They're not protected from them. Absolutely anything can come up behind you and you just don't know what you're going to see every time you dive. 
Now, I do believe we are in an alien world when we go underwater. Humans are not actually made, as I said earlier, the size of our lungs, etc. cetera. Um, we're not made to be in the water and we don't have fish gills. So we have to take all this equipment with us to enable us to go and visit the underwater world. And at the bottom there, I've put don't touch. And that's about the fact that underwater, the creatures have been there. Uh, life in the oceans has been there for over 500 million years. And humans have only been around since the Neanderthals died out and we had modern man on Earth. We've only been around for 44,000 years. So, you know, these creatures have been around for millions of years, longer than humans have been around. And in that time, the uh, creatures and the anim and animals in the ocean have um, started to use chemicals and chemical warfare to stop um, being eaten by something or to help them to find their food. Um, so it's, it's absolutely horrendous down there. Sometimes if you touch something, you get a rash over your hand that will last a week. And it's the chemicals that are in the, in the uh, various animals that they're using against each other. Now, we've got environments on land, we've got forests and deserts and the polar regions, but in the oceans, we also have different types of environments. We have the rock pools. I always believe that as children, hopefully we were lucky enough to go and visit the beach, maybe play in the sand or look at rock pools, which I always thought was the most interesting. And each individual rock pool is an individual environment. Uh, when you grow up, you go out into ships and you go and look out on the, the portholes of your ship and you can see sights like this. Of course, it's not always quite as calm as that. If there's a wind blowing, then you've got a tremendous sort of storm. But, uh, you know, it's all great fun. In the icy parts of the world, the polar regions, you've still got animals too. And underneath, I'm going to introduce you to my first weird creature. Uh, the weird creature is an Arctic cod. Now, it doesn't sound very weird, but when you realise that it's got um, the uh, blood with, uh, that contains antifreeze uh, to stop it freezing in these cold waters, then you think, hang on a minute, yeah, that is actually a bit weird. Now, coral reefs are the cities of underwater life. Uh, they don't exactly have nightclubs and lots of pubs and places to go and enjoy yourself. But for the fish and all the other creatures that live on the coral reefs, this is the place to be. Now, within that one photograph, you have probably got about 10,000 animals. And I'm sure you're thinking, oh, she's lost it. You know, it, it can't possibly be that. I can only see about five orange fish. But if you if I carefully do this, because sometimes it sends my um, computer to showing the next slide. But here we go. Can you see my cursor rolling around that lump of coral? This is a coral called staghorn coral. And if you look very, very carefully, the little tiny white do dots on the coral are the individual coral polyps and coral is an animal. So on that uh, piece of coral alone, that community of coral, you've probably got a thousand animals. And if you look around the rest of the uh, picture there, you can easily get to 10,000 um, of these tiny, small creatures. Now, the only uh, plant in the ocean is seagrass. People think that, often think that uh, seaweed is a plant. Well, it's not, it's an algae. And as a biologist, I'm telling you that you can put different things in different boxes. So you can put animals in a box, you can put plants in a box, and you can put algae in a box. So seaweed is algae. This is a plant and it lives in the shallows because it needs the uh, sunlight to be able to photosynthesize. Now, you may remember your school days and remember what photosynthesis is, but photo means light, synthesis means making, and these green um, plants, whether they are underwater or whether they are in the rainforest, these green plants make oxygen for our planet by photosynthesis. It takes in four small things. It takes in carbon dioxide, some water, some sunlight, and a green chemical called chlorophyll. And out the other end comes oxygen and glucose. So oxygen and glucose 
then disperses into the air as far as the oxygen is concerned. And you will find that there is supplying oxygen for the whole of all the animals that live on Earth because they are all using oxygen. Now, the deep sea world um, is this submersible where they go down. I would love to go down in one of these. I can't afford to buy one. If anyone's a millionaire who's watching this and who can buy me one of these, I'd, I'll, I'll uh, be very grateful to accept it. Uh, but it would keep my camera and me dry if I went down. But there are all sorts of different creatures down there. And we have robotic submersibles as well, with fixed up with lights and cameras uh, that take a lot of the pictures that we have taken from the deep sea life. Now, a few weird fish for you. Now you recognize this is a fish, that's happily a, um, an angel fish. And the idea of these is that, you know, let's have a look at what's different with different things. Well, this is the biggest fish in the sea and it's a shark. Yes, sharks are fish. Now, this is not a shark that's going to eat you. Uh, the biggest shark in the biggest fish in the world is this thing called a whale shark. And it does actually have no teeth. And it looks just like one of the larger whales, which has the baleen netting around its mouth and opens its mouth and just spends all day just traveling through the ocean, collecting up plankton and small creatures. So it doesn't come chasing humans. Now, this is a larger creature in the ocean as well, as far as fish are concerned. It's not the biggest fish, but it's the longest. OK, and we have here a moray eel. Now, I, I tried to show this picture, picture to people because it's actually the first picture um, film that I ever took underwater. The ink was only just dry on my diving certificate. And there I was with my brand new camera dying to go down and take some film. And of course, I went down and in a coral crevice was this giant moray. Now, the giant moray's head is twice the size of mine in all directions, and it's got the sharpest of teeth. And it has actually been known to bite the fingers off of divers. So when I first saw this, I couldn't decide whether to stay and to film it or whether or not just to swim away and stay safe. I was actually pretty scared. Uh, being my first time with such a creature that's such such a large one. Now, actually, if you look down the right hand side of the picture, you can see some white soft coral. Now, that white soft coral uh, just behind there, there was a gap in the coral. So I poked my head and to most of my body in the hole and I put my camera round the corner to film the moray. Now, I couldn't see the moray at all. I'd switched the camera on and hoped for the best. OK, now what I got afterwards when I got back on the dive uh, boat and saw what I'd got, I was quite amazed. But when you think how scared I was of my first dive, I wonder, as when I show you this film, you could just wonder how long do you think you would have stayed where I was? Would you have moved a bit earlier? Have a look. This creature can't um, actually see all of my body, but it will be feeling the fact that my fins are working to keep me, keep me in the, the same place. So it will feel the vibrations in the water. So it starts to realize that I am there. Yeah, that's enough for me. <laughs> okay right let's move on okay so we know that we have got uh reptiles because i've shown you the turtle reptiles in the ocean as as well as fish but hang hang on are all the reptiles nice as friendly as the turtles well no this one is actually the second most poisonous creature in the world. And the first most poisonous creature is, in fact, the uh, little green frog in the Amazon. Now, this creature, I'm not going to talk too long about it. It's called a sea crate. I met up with one of these in the Philippines and I did have um, a little adventure with it, shall we say, where it got a little bit too close. And actually, I'm quite lucky to still be here. Um, but it's a very nasty creature. Now, against nastiness, this one is cute, 
friendly and intelligent. And it will come playing around divers all the time when they see us. And I've swum with these a lot. So dolphins, they're just wonderful. They're just very friendly. But I have to tell you that this is actually a dolphin too. This is the largest of the dolphin species. And it's a killer whale. Now, the scientific name is orca. But this is a creature that actually has now been um, documented as killing great white sharks. And it kills the shark by uh, taking large bites out the side of its body, extracting and eating the liver and then leaving that great white shark to die. Also recently, there has been a report that off the coast of Portugal, there is uh, there has been two pods of orcas reported that have been attacking sailing boats. And I can assure you that if I thought there were any orcas anywhere near in the waters that I was diving, you wouldn't find me in that water. No way. I would dive with sharks anytime, but not orcas. So nasty creatures. Now, this is something from the deep. On the left, you've got a viper fish. Don't forget these creatures are in such darkness they cannot see each other. So on the left is the viper fish, great big teeth, big open mouth waiting to eat something. On the right, a little tiny red uh, shrimp. It's not red for real, but it's the way the photograph is taken. Now, that little shrimp is trying to protect itself. And what it's done, it's spat out into the water it's a chemical. This is chemical warfare going on. Now, the, 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 neither creature can see each other, but they know they're there by the, the vibrations in the water. So the shrimp knows the vi viper fish is there. It spits out photophosphorescence. That lights up the water in front of the viper fish's face. And the viper fish goes, oh, what's that? I'm not used to light down here, what's that? And in that short time, the shrimp can get away. Now, I always credit Edith Widder, Dr. Edith Widder, from the Harbour Branch Oceanographic Institute in America. She has spent her scientific research life dealing with cameras and photographs from deep in the waters and taking photographs of animals in the deep sea. And I think she's done a brilliant job. So I always say thank you to be able to use that particular picture. Most of the other pictures on this screen you will find is actually mine or my fellow divers. OK, so moving on. These are invertebrates, means they don't have backbones in their body. These are sea slugs and they're nothing like the garden uh, slugs that you have in your in your uh, garden. You, uh, they're little black and slimy and clamber under your kitchen door. No, nothing like that. These are gorgeous. They are cute. They are beautiful. There are three thousand different types of sea slug and they're all different colors and they're all different patterns they can't see very well these two little black horns on the front of their heads are actually eye organs which just give them light and dark and the little feathery things at the back are their versions of fish uh, gills so they can absorb water through those special organs Moving on, this is one of the tiniest creatures in the world. If you look at your hand, look at your little finger, look at the size of your little fingernail. This is the same size. This rather gorgeous crustacean with its little feathery legs is a krill. And I think it seems to exist with the only reason uh, it, it, for its existence being that it's food for the blue whale. Now, I can't tell you how big the whale is. The, I mean, the krill and the, this picture of the blue whale seem like they're the same size, but they're not. Uh, the krill is the size of your fingernail and the blue whale, well, how can I tell you? Just roll your tongue round your mouth. How big do you think your tongue is? And in fact, most of you will probably come up with about a quarter of the back of your hand. Yeah, about a quarter of the back of your hand. Now. A blue whale tongue is the size of an elephant. Oh, I can't eat an elephant, can you? This is actually the largest creature on Earth. It's absolutely enormous. Now, the largest creature on Earth and the largest creature that has ever been on Earth, because all those fossils of dinosaurs, you, you can't actually... Um, find any fossils of dinosaurs where they're bigger 
than the blue whale. Blue whale beats the lot, the largest creature ever on Earth. In fact, it's so large, it's, it's blood vessels you could swim through. This is a model of the blue whale's heart, and it's in a museum in Canada. And you see there are two people sitting inside the blood vessels. So quite big, okay? These are the smallest creatures. Here we've got times 8,000 magnification from um, uh, a, a microscope, uh, a special microscope. You will find these little green creatures. I'm giving you a clue there as to what they do. These are diatoms. They all join together to make plankton. And plankton is in the ocean supplying up to 70 percent of Earth's oxygen. Now, with the 10 percent I've already told you about of uh, uh, the seagrass giving you oxygen, the oceans are now, you must now realize, are giving us 80 percent of all the oxygen that's produced on the planet. So, yes, the rainforest produced 20. And please go out and carry on looking after rainforests because they need us. But 80 percent of all the oxygen that we as humans and all animals on Earth, apart from very tiny bacteria at the bottom of the ocean, which doesn't use oxygen, apart from those, every animal on Earth uses oxygen. And it's the oceans that are supplying 80 percent of that oxygen. Now, scientists say there are possibly two to 10 million species still to find, uh, and they've got still some gorgeous creatures that are being found every single day. Scientists are actually using the chemicals from underwater to see if they can cure cancers and other things. And on the left here, you've got the green sponges that they're looking at at the moment. And the idea here is that they're trying to find chemicals that we don't have on land and haven't yet developed. They've also found a jellyfish recently, which has the ability, as it gets older, it has the ability to change itself back into a larva instead of dying. So they've called it the immortal jellyfish. Now, at this stage, I say to you, right, that's all about the weird fish. Most people often ask, well, Gloria, what is your favourite weird fish? Uh, so I'll answer the question straight away because I know most of you will ask it. There he is. He's called the blobfish. Now, the blobfish is actually a gelatinous mass. He's a jelly, solid jelly. Uh, he is a fish. He came up uh, from the Australian waters about five years ago in a fisherman's net from about two kilometres down. And they've worked out, scientists have worked out that he could feed himself by getting his body just about wobbling enough to raise up off the bottom of the seabed and then dropping back down again. And then it would go by dropping into the sand, it would release clouds of sand, which then uh, will enable it to uh, get food out of the sand. Now, when the Australians first found this, they actually called it the ugliest creature on earth. They even gave it a certificate. Here you are, blobfish. You've been named the ugliest creature in the world. Well, I'm sorry. Actually, I don't think it's very ugly. I think it's really rather cute. Uh, but why do I think that? I, I, ah, do you know what? It reminds me of my granddad. That's why I like it. My granddad had a bald head. My granddad had an extremely large nose. And after Sunday lunch, after a big dinner, he would sit on the settee and sleep and he would dribble. <clears throat> so if you hear of anybody being nasty about the blue, the blobfish, then please, you know, just just like, excuse me, that's Gloria's grandma you're talking about. You know, can you stop? And let's be nice. OK, here's the sciencey bits. That's why do we need healthy oceans? Let's get going and get it on with. We need it because oceans are home to these millions of species of incredible animals. And as humans, we are actually, I believe, responsible for all life on Earth and making sure that the activities of humans don't destroy the lives of animals. Um, so it, there is that. But there is also what you've learned today, and maybe for the first time you've learned this, oceans supply 80% of the world's oxygen. So it's incredibly important. 
And also this idea that all life on Earth uses the same system. We've all come from life in the ocean originally. We've evolved from life that was first in the ocean. And as a consequence, we are all oxygen breathers with the same system inside every single cell of our bodies, whether you're a giraffe or an ant or a human or a fish. You all have the same type of system in your bodies, which use oxygen to make energy for your bodies to work. So without oceans, life on Earth would not exist because we wouldn't have enough oxygen. Now, oceans now, I need some really sad things to tell you about. Uh, we've got pollution. You've heard of plastic pollution, sewage pollution, sound pollution is there as well, and oil, and we're overfishing. Now, this is where I was lucky enough to stay for about four days. It's a beautiful hotel uh, on the uh, banks of the, on the side of the ocean in Trincomalee in Sri Lanka. Now, all the time I was on this beach, there were staff coming along, picking up the rubbish that was being blown in from the oceans. But I used to get up and wander around and I walked off the hotel complex one day and this was around the corner. And this was local fishermen trying to get fish to feed their families. And they weren't even able to walk on the beach. And of course, if you've got all this rubbish floating and you can see it in the ocean there, it floats in. Uh, with all the currents that bring it across the Indian Ocean, because <clears throat> this is the east coast of uh, Trincomalee. Now, if you think it's bad on the surface, then this is what is underneath. Uh, this is called uh, um, plastic soup, and it's, it's quite horrendous as to uh, how much there is. I'm lucky enough not to have ever dived in that. I have been on a small boat that was going into a harbour where it pushed the plastic out of the way for it to get to the quayside. Um, and I was absolutely certain that underneath all the plastic you could see on the surface, there would be this sort of scene underneath. At the end of this talk, I'm going to show you a film um, of underwater in the Red Sea, and you will think it's pristine. Well, that's because every diver who dives in the Red Sea, and there's a lot, uh, we all pick up rubbish and put them into mesh bags and bring it all back up again. So whenever we're diving, we're picking up rubbish. Um, so it will look pristine, but it, it is all over the world, a scene like this. We are also overfishing. This is actually containing 440 tonnes of fish in one net. And of course, the fishermen are also uh, discarding nets when they break. They don't repair them. They drop them back into the ocean. And it's 25% of the plastic rubbish is actually plastic nets. What's our future? Well, are we the last generation to eat fish? We are if super trawlers continue to take that amount of fish every time they put a net out. But they're also taking out all the other creatures they're not actually fishing for. They're taking sharks and dolphins, mantas and turtles and so on. So it's, it's decimation of the seabed and of the oceans. Now, I want to talk to you very quickly about the invisible danger to all life on Earth. And it's not COVID. This is carbon dioxide. Now, carbon dioxide is natural. It's erupted Ooh. from volcanoes, which is quite natural on the planet. And man-made, unfortunately, is not natural. We are using fossil fuels for all types of things. You all know it. We are producing CO2 into the atmosphere. And it's getting a little bit silly because at the moment, the oceans are really struggling to deal with it. Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have burnt enough fossil wastes now to develop so much carbon dioxide in the, office, in the atmosphere that we have got so much. This chart only goes up to the year 2000, so it's 20 years out of date. So add another 20 years worth of going up at that angle and you'll see that we are making, in the year 2000, we were making a six and a half million metric tonnes of carbon uh, dioxide emissions. Well, you can extend that now uh, to very, very large amounts. It is really quite horrific. Oceans, all this time, all the millions of years that, since they were um, started on Earth, uh, which is billions of years ago, have acted as a carbon sink. And a carbon sink which absorbs CO2 from the oxygen, from the atmosphere. So for years, the, the ocean has been taking out carbon. 
But the CO2 gas now, it's got too much in the oceans. It's now turning to carbonic acid. And that is turning the oceans acidic. So too much CO2 turning to carbonic acid, making the oceans acidic. Acidity is causing the plankton to die. Plankton and seagrass provide 80% of our oxygen. So we've got ourselves into a circle, a ridiculous circle of burning fossil fuels so much and still doing it that it's actually going to kill us because there won't be enough oxygen for people or animals to live on the planet. So it is quite serious. We need to stop destroying our planet. People have been shouting this for ages, but it's not correct. It's not the planet that we are going to destroy. The planet will go on for another 4.5 billion years until the, the planet, uh, the sun rather, which is a star, which will turn into a big giant red star. It will expand in about 4.5 billion years. And that will expand. It will engulf um, Mercury, the nearest planet to the sun. Then it will engulf Venus, the second and then it will engulf the Earth. And we expect that to happen in 4.5 billion years. Until then, this planet will exist, whether there are humans on it or animals on it or not. This planet will still exist. But what are we destroying? We are destroying all life on ocean, um, on, on Earth. Every year we use more resources than the Earth can replace. And we're doing two things wrong. We are not being sustainable and looking to the future. We're using up all the resources on Earth. And we need to look at our actions as consumers of what we are taking in. And we're taking far too much. What we need to do is think global, think about the, the, the problems with the world, but actually act in a local way. I'm an optimist. I reckon we can save the world, save life on Earth. Yes, we can. We do have the technology and the scientists already. The scientists have already made so much stuff for us to be able to exist without uh, fossil fuels. We could actually live happily from tomorrow. Uh, but what we do have to change is to put our minds to all of this, to change the systems that we're using and to change human thinking. Now, this is the sort of human thinking I'm talking about. It's a little boy with an oxygen tank on his back and he's not very happy because he can't breathe properly. The background is pretty bleak and awful. There's nothing green left on the planet. But a father thinks he's done his job. Here, son, I saved all this money for your future. We think we need to change that, don't we? That's a cartoon, although it's not funny. That's a cartoon from Canada that I found the other day. And I think it says just so much about the situation we're getting ourselves into, blindly going forward without realising what we're doing to our planet. I certainly believe this phrase, never doubt that a small group of people can change the world, whether it's your family, your village, your community, your town, your, your county, your country, your world. You can all work together to change what we're doing. What can I do, people ask me? Quite simply, really, you've got to redu reduce carbon emissions. And we do that by reducing the use of fossil fuels. We do it by reducing the use of transport. And we do it by reducing eating things like meat and fish, which are responsible to each person. Meat consumption is 25% of your carbon emissions. Then comes transport. Then comes, you know, everything else that goes with normal life. Now, I'm going to stop being so serious and horrible about the science and environmental future of the planet. And I'm going to say to you that if you took me and looked at the inside of me, I'm like a stick of rock with the word education written right the way through, all the way down. I've, it's been my life to be educating people. So the environmental education project that I want to talk to you about um, is for the next generation. We need not only to educate people like yourselves listening this afternoon, but we need to educate the next generation. And this is what has been happening. 
I work with Top Left Footprint to the Future. Footprint to the Future is a social enterprise run by volunteers. I'm one of those volunteers. There are seven professional educators who work with me. Now, Target Blue is our ocean education resource, and it, we've developed it to help children learn about keeping the oceans healthy. It's a teacher's resource, first of all, all in one box or three separate digital packs, however a teacher wants to get hold of it. This is available to teachers. OK, I've put the website underneath at the bottom of the next three slides. Very easy. www.barnet, that's me, author.co.uk. OK, so for teachers, you can buy the teacher's resource. And one teacher has told us it was like having an expert at their elbow and they found they could teach properly about the oceans because they didn't know about it before and they can now do it properly. For your family or as a gift for a primary school, buy something, give it to a school. Um, the, there's an, a, a non-fiction book. Now, the thing about my books is the non-fiction books are all in the English language. They're not written in science language so that you can understand it all. Uh, and it's, uh, you're able just to sit down and read it. This is for age 10 to 110. So, uh, you know, uh, good readers in schools or adults. Again, you know, nonfiction tells you everything you need to know about the oceans. But we also have uh, fiction books, fishy tales, little people, three to six, who just want to fall in love with animals, whether they are lobsters or pufferfish. OK, it's all about ocean animals. The Lucy Adventures, eight to 12 year olds, the eight to 12 year olds, I'm told, are the biggest influencers in the planet. And it's them getting their parents to do things that actually changes the world. So this is who we're trying to get to. The eight to 12 year olds in schools. Let's get to them or in your families. If you've got eight to 12 year olds, this is what you need to buy. Um, the three books uh, are adventure books. Now let me move on to this. It looks terrible. Let me help you. Um, three books. Let's go on the left. Three books. The first one has got an adventure story, but there's a theme about ocean plastics. The second one, an adventure book, but a theme about protecting the ocean life and the habitats. The third one, it's an adventure story and it's a problems with fishing. There's George, who is, uh, he really is a real person. It's George Booth. Um, he is uh, now uh, age 12. He wrote this a year ago. I really enjoyed this Lucy Morgan adventure story. The thrill that came out of it was great. People like Lucy, that's the character heroine, are especially important in this world because they care about the environment and show us how to look after it. I found it essential, this lesson about the sea and what we can do to help it. I can't wait for another book. So that is someone who is that right age group for that book telling you, yeah, come on, give me some more books. So gift things. If you're in a school, if you're a teacher, if you're seeing all this stuff and you want to buy stuff for your school, contact me, Gloria at Barnet Author, and I'll talk to you about buying in bulk. OK, right. We're almost at the end now. And finally, I'm saying to you, come on, come diving with me. OK, come underwater and see the ocean world for yourselves. If you've never been, I'm gonna hold your hand. Come on, hold my hand. I'm gonna take you diving. We're going to the Red Sea. It's a wreck that went down in 1874. Now you can see here, it's been taken over by coral. So it's now a coral reef. And all the creatures that are living on this are protected by the, so the, the ship itself. They're protected from predators or from heavy currents or storms. Here's the most beautiful raccoon butterfly fish. And there is a striped uh, a angel fish. And look, a hawk fish who doesn't like us coming too close. Look at all this staghorn coral. Look at all those little white dots. There's a million coral animals living on that flat table coral there. And at the back, you can see the way that the humans who built this boat originally sh uh, are shown what they've done. Now, here's a shoal of yellow snappers and they will part as I let you come through with me and the camera through the shoal. And there's another shoal behind. 
Oh, be careful. Don't go close to that last, last nasty um, piece of metal. It's very rusty. More, more shoals of fish and lots of individual little fish underneath. If you could see them, different fish swimming around. Very happy. This is their home. And there, a large fish that won't eat anything other than algae. It won't hurt you. And there is another moray, a giant moray, this time with a cleaner fish taking the parasites off the skin of the moray. The little anthia fish are orange and dashing around, very excited that we're here. And a little orange stripe at the back of the tail of that surgeon fish is its knife because it can cut its food up when it slashes another fish and actually ends up eating it. So there we go. Let's have one more slide. It's basically my granddad. So here we go. Goodbye from granddad and goodbye from me.